but it's not always easy to read out of the text exactly what the implications are for our time or for any time. Inspired by the Quran's teaching and Muhammad's charismatic leadership, all Medina converted to Islam. The instructions handed down to the Prophet became the laws of the city. It was a, a community that was run by this revelation that was constantly coming forth from Muhammad's mouth. This was a living, breathing, constantly evolving revelation. The revelation soon gave the Muslims permission to take up arms as a means of survival. The authorities in Mecca still maintained a bounty on the Prophet's head for preaching against their religious practices and threatening the fabric of their economy and they were not minded to tolerate Muhammad's new role as head of state in Medina. In the year 622, Mecca declared war on Muhammad and his followers in Medina. Just as the Quran had given them laws when the community needed order, at this crucial moment, it gave them permission to defend themselves against their attackers when they were under threat and fight for the cause of God, those who fight you. But do not be aggressive. Surely God does not like the aggressors. Kill them wherever you find them and drive them out, from wherever they drove you out. Chapter 2, verse 190. Today, these verses, known as the sword verses, constitute some of the most striking and controversial passages in the Quran. Those who argue that the Quran condones or even promotes violence quote these verses to support their claims. But the lines are more complex than simple battle cries. The Quran says, slay the unbelievers wherever you find them. Well, this is within a context in which the uh, Muslims are under siege, they have enemies, and the Quran is saying, you know, fight your enemies. You have a right to fight the enemies of God. The Quran also says, when the enemy ceases to be a threat, when it ceases to fight, then remember that God is merciful, remember that, you know, warfare is not the primary way that you should go. Fortified by Muhammad's encouragement, the Muslims spent eight years fighting the forces of Mecca in battles the length and breadth of the Arabian Peninsula. Then, in the year 630, the Muslims launched an attack, taking an army of 10,000 men to besiege Mecca. The city had no choice but to surrender. Tradition holds that, true to the Quran's instructions, Muhammad was merciful in victory and granted amnesty to everyone in the city. Once the Meccans capitulated, many converted to Islam and embraced the teachings of the Quran. But Muhammad's mission wasn't yet complete. From the day he received the first revelation in 610 to the day he fled to Medina 12 years later, Muhammad had publicly condemned the pagan practices of Mecca and the worship of idols in the Kaaba. There is no God but God, he repeatedly recited, expressing again and again the Quran's most fundamental principle. So Muhammad entered the Kaaba and destroyed all the idols ensconced there and proclaimed it a sanctuary devoted entirely to the worship of the one and only true God. Muhammad had achieved what he visualized as his goal and that uh, he had done what God wanted him to do. In 632, two years after returning to his birthplace, Muhammad died at the age of 62. As he exhaled his last breath, the Quran was complete. However, it did not yet exist in any physical form, but only in the memories of those who would listen to him. The messenger was dead. Now would come the struggle to ensure that the message would live on. According to Islamic tradition, 14 centuries ago, the verses of the Quran were revealed to the Prophet Muhammad over a period of 22 years. These verses were believed to be the literal words of God. The Prophet had preached about everything under the sun, from religion to law to morality, and the newly born Muslim community tried to live by his every word. 
But following his death in 632, they had to confront the thorny challenge of preserving these words, which were still being recited from memory. During the Prophet's lifetime, the Quran itself was never written down. It was never even really considered a codified text. Remember that the Quran was revealed in stages, and it was always revealed according to whatever the needs of the expanding Muslim community was at the time. And the Quran just simply ceased with the Prophet's final breath. At that point, those who lived by the tenets of the Quran recognized the need to set its words down on paper, or more probably stone or palm leaf, and create an actual text. People realized that this early generation that had memorized the entire Quran was dying off. And so therefore they were losing the direct connection to the Prophet's revelation. What's more, Islam was beginning to spread beyond the Arabian Peninsula, and minor variations in the recitation of the Quran were emerging. The Word of God was slowly being altered. According to tradition, a committee charged with compiling the Quran was appointed in 651 by Uthman, the third caliph, the political leader of the Muslim community. The committee was authorized to collect and authenticate the verses, some of which had been written down during the life of the Prophet, but remained scattered throughout the community. We're told that the sources for this compilation were written texts on pieces of bone or fragments of parchment, but also from the hearts of men, from their own memories of the Quran's recitation. To be included in the final text, the verses had to meet strict criteria. Two eyewitnesses had to testify that each verse had been recorded in the presence of the Prophet, and all the verses had to be checked against the memories of the companions who had learned the entire Quran by heart. The approved text was amassed into a single volume, which was copied and sent to cities throughout the region. Uthman then ordered that all other written versions of the verses be destroyed. Muslims believe that Uthman's text, which was completed within 20 years of the Prophet's death, perfectly preserved God's revelation as preached by Muhammad, and that the Quran of today remains unaltered from that moment. To Muslims, this is very important because it means that their scripture, which is the basic constitution of the Ummah, of the community, is absolutely authentic. It is this clarity and authenticity that Islam claims distinguishes the Quran from the Christian and Jewish scriptures. Muhammad proclaimed that the message he received from God was the same message that was taught by Moses and Jesus. But according to Islam, when the revelations that became the basis of Judaic and Christian religions were written down in the Old and New Testaments, parts of them were corrupted. Muslims believe that the original revelation to Moses and Jesus came to be distorted over time. So that what we have in, if you will, the Old Testament and the New Testament is in fact both the original revelation and distortions, that is, changes that occurred because of historical, religious and political conditions at the time. There is among them a section who distort the book with their tongues so that you would think it is part of the book but it is no part of the book. <laughs> 